Hi, Jared. Hi, Jason. How are you? Doing well, Shabam. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I guess we'll wait for a couple of minutes. People are joining in and I see a lot of people are joining in. So we'll wait for a couple of minutes before we start the session. for the people who are already here in attendees. So we are three people in three cities across two time zones separated by three hours. So thanks to technology, we all are together. I guess we can start now and so good afternoon, good morning and good evening everyone. I see people from across the globe joining us for this webinar. Hello everyone, I'm Shabam, Senior Product Marketing Manager at GTR and your host for today. I'm thrilled to see so many of you join us. For those of us who don't know ZTR, we are a 37 year old rail technology company that has been providing technology solutions to the rail industry, including locomotive control systems and telematic solutions. Our oldest telematic solution dates to 1999 and our experience with telematics expands to our other industries, including building, power generation, oil and gas, and more. And here we are. Welcome to our webinar telematics for rail cars, bridging gaps, enhancing efficiency. This webinar aims to explore telematics in general, how it is being used in other industries and how telematic solutions have the potential of revolutionizing rail car management, optimizing operations, and ultimately enhancing efficiency through rail transportation landscape. I'm confident, I'm confident that by the end of our session, you will gain valuable insights into the potential of tel telematics and its transformative impact on the real industry. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar and we'll answer the questions at the end of the presentation. So let's delve into this exciting topic and explore the possibilities together. Once again, welcome and thank you for joining us. Let me introduce our panelists for today's webinar. Jared Devries brings over a decade of real industry experience, excelling in both commercial and operational capacities. He's passionate about leveraging telematics to tackle industry challenges. Joining him is our expert, Jason Toonstra, an experienced product development manager specializing in rail IoT applications with over 15 years of technical leadership across various industries. Together, they bring a wealth of expertise to our discussion. So without further ado, I'll invite Jarek to take us through this journey. Thanks, Shabam, for the warm welcome. As mentioned, my name is Jared DeVries, and I've been within the rail industry for over 10 years, spending most of my career at CP Rail, now CPKC, uh, but recently joining ZTR to follow my passion of bringing telematics to the railway industry, and specifically rail cars. So I hope you will all join me on this webinar as we provide a background of why we are here, why we're doing this telemar, or webinar, and why telematics for rail cars are needed. I will start the webinar by providing a very brief overview of the rail industry, 
and highlighting the challenges the industry faces. Then I will give a very general overview of what telematics is for, for those who may be unfamiliar. From there, we will discuss the gaining momentum of telematics for rail cars and discuss the basic uses for the rail car industry. I will then share a real life story of an incident that happened recently and how telematics could have helped. And from there, I will expand on some of the broader challenges shippers and rail car owners face before introducing ZTR's pivot product and how it can solve many of these challenges. We will then end the webinar by embarking on a hypothetical rail car journey to contrast how much value telematics can offer compared to a rail car that does not have telematics. And, uh, and then we will summarize what these benefits are along with discussing some potential future exciting possibilities. And as Shabam mentioned uh, at the end, we will have a question and answer period. We hope to have lots of time left to answer your questions. Um, so if you have a question throughout the presentation, put it in the chat in the webinar. And uh, when we get to the end, we will have a chance to uh, respond to your questions. So first, just to highlight some interesting facts about the rail industry. I do realize there are people from outside North America joining us, um, and many of these facts will be relevant to you as well, um, but some of them won't be. But given most of our audience is within North America, we decided to focus uh, these stats specifically for the North American rail industry. So you'll see those four stats on the screen. Um, the North American freight rail network is nearly 180,000 miles long in total. Uh, the U.S. by far is the largest contributor to this. They have a freight network, network of 140,000 miles. Um, it, up in Canada, which is where Shabam, Jason, and I all are, uh, there's about 31,000 miles of track in Canada, and then followed uh, in a distant third by Mexico, which has about 7,000 miles in Mexico. Um, so altogether, that's about 180,000 miles. Um, and that is enough, just to give you, put that number into context, that is enough uh, miles to wrap around the circumference of the earth seven times plus a little bit. So just gives you a sense of how huge that network is. Um, again, these numbers may change depending on which geography and country you're in, but here in North America, 40% um, of all of the long distance ton miles, freight ton miles that travel over land um, are tra travel in trains and train has the is the largest mode of transportation in this aspect when it comes to long distance ton miles. In total, uh, the US economy uh, moved 1.6 billion tons of freight uh, last year. So lots and lots of freight. I think that works out to 3.2 tons per person. Many of you may already be aware of this, but one of the big benefits of the rail industry that not everyone is, is familiar with is the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions that it provides compared to truck. As it says on the screen, um, trains can actually give you a 75% reduction of greenhouse emissions. That could come as a surprise for people. You see that large locomotive powering by and you smell the diesel fume coming off of it. Um, but why it still leads to that level of greenhouse gas emissions is because of the amount of trucks that a train takes off the road. As that graphic say, says, one train um, is, typically responsible for taking over 300 trucks off the road. So you can just imagine the impact that has in terms of an emissions standpoint, not to mention uh, the congestion on the road. So next time you get blocked by a train at a level crossing, instead of getting frustrated at it, just uh, thank it for uh, taking all those trucks off the road and helping you have a less challenging commute on the highway. So, I kind of alluded to this in the agenda. Why are we here? What's what's the, the big issue? Really what it is, is trucks are taking over freight, uh, the market share from, from rail. As the graph indicates, um, rail share in freight has gone down from 51% in 2011 to just 37% in 2020. And this is really the problem we as an industry are looking to solve and where telematics can hopefully play a role. Now, I should say it's important to note the overall share of the transportation pie has been growing as the economy grows and as the population increases. Um, and annual rail volumes have actually generally grown over this period listed as well. Um, so this isn't to suggest that the rail industry is in a dire state or on the verge of death, 
However, it just highlights the, the lack of growth um, and how the growth in the rail industry has not kept pace with truck. Um, so this is the ultimately the problem that we as an industry are looking to solve. And if the current trends continue without any changes, this percentage of market share is going to decline even further. Now, there are many reasons why this gap is projected to continue to widen, and we could likely do a whole webinar on that topic alone, but I'm not gonna do that. And the key here is that unless we want, to, want this trend to continue, the rail industry as a whole needs to change. The good news is it is starting to change, and we will get into that a little bit later. But before I get into that, I thought I should provide a brief overview of what telematics is for those of you who may not be too familiar with it. The textbook definition is that telematics is a multidisciplinary field that combines telecommunications, sensor technology, and computer science to enable remote monitoring and communication of data related to vehicles or assets. I know that's about a little bit of a mouthful. Really what it's all about is using sensors to communicate specific information via either satellite or the cellular network, communicating that to computers so people can analyze and make use of the information accordingly. That's basically what telematics is. So this is, as this slide shows, um, this is just a graphical representation of that process and textbook definition I read. Uh, a satellite is used to determine the location of the telematics device on a vehicle, rail car, or in the palm of your hand. And then that information is sent over the telecommunications or cellular network to servers, which then convert the information into data points that can be beautifully viewed on your smartphone or computer screen. Over the years, telematics technology has evolved from basic GPS tracking systems to sophisticated sensors that can detect many other activities. Specifically in the logistics industry and probably more accurately, the trucking industry, telematics have become quite widespread and measure all of these things that you see on the screen, which I won't get into. All of these new data points have given firms and companies in this space a lot more information at their fingertips to allow for better decision making and ultimately giving them a return on investment. So while the data and the data points might be different, these additional insights that telematics provide is ultimately what telematics would bring to the rail industry. So we wouldn't measure these exact same things that the trucking industry measures, but we'd be measuring other things that would bring value. And so it's no wonder that the market for telematics has been growing steadily doubling every four years approximately, and is expected to continue to grow by 10 to 20% annually, depending on who you ask. I should note that there are various telematics market studies and projections, so don't take these numbers on the screen as gospel. As I said, it kind of depends on which source you get your information from. But the main point here is that it's a rapidly growing industry that is expected to continue to grow into the future, including in the rail industry. So here are just a few of the many benefits that have been unlocked by the use of telematics in the logistics industry. Again, these are mostly trucking related and I'm not gonna get into too much uh, detail into these other than to mention that the industry has drastically changed and become more efficient as a result of the introduction of telematics. And this is the exact same trajectory we hope will happen as it relates to rail cars. So, this brings us specifically to telematics and the rail industry, or telematics in the rail industry. And what I like to say, the lack of telematics in the rail industry. There are some telematic solutions deployed on locomotives, but on the rail cars themselves, by and large, up until quite recently, there have basically been zero telematics equipped. This is kind of crazy if you think about it. We can track a $10 food order better than we can track a, a rail car moving $250,000 worth of product. So you might ask yourself, why hasn't this adoption happened already, given the value of freight that's moving by rail? The answer isn't simple, and I won't try to explain the very reasons. Uh, that could probably also have its own dedicated webinar. Um, but the main point is that the good news is things are changing and are changing at an accelerated pace. And so I'm gonna go through some of those changes with you. However, first, before we do that, um, before we get into some of the uses of telematics and rail car operations, we thought we'd put out a poll 
and uh, gauge the audience's level of familiarity with telematics and rail car operations. So please um, take, an, take a moment to think about this question, read the answer, and uh, if you could let us know, um, you know, one, two, or three, that would be great, and we'll, we'll give you a moment to um, put those answers in. Okay, yeah, so um, looks like uh, there's some various levels of uh, familiarity. More than half of you are at least somewhat familiar, and, and then it's about an equal amount that are very familiar and an equal amount that aren't familiar at all. So I think there'll be something for everyone in this, uh, this webinar, and hopefully already there's been some uh, interesting points for you. But we're going we're gonna to get into rail car telematics in more detail. So thank you for, for uh, sharing that. So, as I mentioned, the rail industry is slowly changing, and one of the main drivers behind this building momentum for telematics in the railway industry is starting to accelerate. And the Rail Pulse Initiative has been one of the driving forces behind this momentum. So, for those of you who don't know who Rail Pulse is, I'm just going to read the text on the screen here. I don't normally like to do this, but I think it's important just to kind of explain who they are. Uh, rail Pulse is a coalition of forward-thinking rail car owners who have joined together to facilitate and accelerate the adoption of GPS and other telematics technology across the North American rail car network to significantly increase visibility, efficiency, and safety. So you'll note there that this is specifically a North American in initiative. Um, this isn't to say that there aren't other initiatives ongoing uh, in Europe or Asia or South America. Um, but I just thought it's it's important to note that this is rail pulse is one of the driving forces of telematics adoption in North America. Um, it's important to note as well that the owners that make up rail pulse um, are made up of a cross section of industry players with members including class one railways themselves, uh, short lines, rail car lessors, rail car manufacturers, and most recently shippers as well. So this is an important element to this initiative as it ensures a balanced and representative approach that benefits all industry players uh, for the greater success of the industry as a whole. Um, and as you can see here, I've taken out the two points that are really the main focus of the Rail Pulse initiative, which is trying to accelerate telematics adoption in North America and having equal representation for the entire rails ecosystem, while also increasing visibility, efficiency, and safety. But if you're not part of Rail Pulse or have never heard of them, that's okay. Um, this by no means does this mean telematics adoption can't happen without Rail Pulse. Um, again, this is just showing that momentum is building as more and more shippers, owners, railways in North America, you know, get on board with this uh, this this coalition. So getting into the specifics of what type of telematics are going to be used in rail cars, um, the main focus is around providing visibility to rail cars in three key areas. So first one is location. This one may seem obvious, um, but this is about you know tracking track level GPS latitude and longitude location of the rail car, both while it's moving and while it's stopped. And uh, there's obviously many benefits to this, including more accurate ETAs and greater visibility. Um, condition is the second key element that Telematics is looking to measure. This is really about the status of the car in terms of whether the car is loaded, doors are open or closed, hatches are opened or closed, um, and any other onboard sensors that measure what's going on. Impact data, for example. Um, these data points can be used to identify usage patterns and understand you know, analytics around how much was the car loaded versus how much was it empty, how many miles did it 
travel loaded versus empty, all that type of, type of thing. And as well, uh, health is the last key element. Um, being able to monitor the mechanical health of the car in terms of all the different components that make up the rail car and be able to have the sensors predict or help identify potential uh, issues that occur that could affect the health of the rail car that may need to be fixed. So let's take a look at just one recent real world example of what happened and how telematics could have played a role in the railway supply chain just to show you, you know, the importance of what telematics can do. So in April of 2023, so again, not that long ago, almost not even a year ago, a covered hopper rail car loaded with 30 tons of ammonium nitrate, which if you don't know what ammonium nitrate is, it's mostly, it's a chemical, it's mostly used as a fertilizer, but it can also be used to make explosive as well. So definitely not something you want to uh, lose. Um, but anyways, a rail car with 30 tons of ammonium nitrate left Cheyenne, Wyoming. Two weeks after the car departed origin, the car was discovered to be empty at a rail stop in the Mojave Desert. But nobody knew why. Was there a broken or defective outlet hatch that caused the product to spill out? Did somebody tamper with the car and steal the product? Or was it possible that the car was simply empty the entire time and was simply erroneously billed as a load, even though it was empty? That happens sometimes. In the aftermath, immediate aftermath, nobody could really know for sure what happened. Um, and the speculation was simply that it was a billing error. That was the most logical explanation for how a rail car could leave loaded and suddenly be empty. However, upon further investigation, it was revealed that indeed the car was loaded at origin and that the product likely leaked out of an outlet gate while it was in transit. Although, even though this was the determined cause, most likely cause, it was unclear where or when this loss of cargo occurred. So this incident, and there's many other incidents we could go over, and we will go through some theoretical examples, but this incident highlights the need for enhanced telematics and tracking technologies in the rail freight transportation. And you can imagine what telematics could have done in this scenario. It could have been able to, to right away know whether that rail car was indeed loaded or or not when it left the shipper um, and then sensors on that door and or gate outlet gate hatch could have detected the loss of cargo not only where but when so that previous example is really just one challenge that rail shippers might experience which is you know the security of the cargo but obviously there are many others before we get into a full listing of some of the challenges and discuss how telematics can play a role, we wanted to pull the audience uh, to see what the biggest hurdles you might be facing are in terms of managing a rail car supply chain. Or if you're a fleet owner uh, managing a rail car fleet. And if you aren't either of those, don't worry if you're not a shipper and you're not a fleet owner, just answer these questions based on what you may have heard um, from other people in the industry. Um, and then we can uh, take a look at what your responses are. And, and don't worry, if, if the option is not on the screen, uh, you can just pick other and maybe you can put it in the comments section or in the chat about what your biggest challenge is. So I'll leave it, uh, leave a few minutes or about a minute or so for you to answer that question. Hey, I think most people seem to have voted, uh, so I will. So looks like, uh, you know, there's not one overwhelming majority, but uh, the majority of you picked supply chain visibility as your, you know, number one um, 
you know, option. Um, and, uh, you know, we will go over all of these uh, options together and, you know, how telematics can solve these problems, but that's good to know. Thank you for your responses. So here are a few other challenges we have heard from shippers mostly, um, but not just shippers, owners as well. But most of these challenges on this screen are, are for shippers. Um, so some of these may be familiar to what you have experienced on, on if you're a shipper. Um, hopefully some of these resonate with you. So no real time location data. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the North American uh, way of tracking rail cars today, um, rail cars are you know, given rail car location messages or CLMs that are generated from track wayside detectors that scan an AEI tag. It's a tag on the side of a rail car and it basically is just like a barcode scanner that scans the rail car's location as it passes the scanner. That is uh, really the only way shippers in North America or rail car owners in North America can see where their rail car is, but it's not in real time. It only is intermittent. Um, so that's one issue that people have. Unreliable ETAs, sort of the same, you know, kind of reason here as to why this is happening. Uh, these CLM notifications are oftentimes delayed or in some cases are not accurate or even available. These scanners aren't located everywhere. There are certain areas of the, the 180,000 mile rail network where there just isn't scanners. Um, so any delays on route are hard to predict and not easily tracked. Uh, inaccurate dwell time reporting. This is a big one that we hear from a lot of customers. Um, whether this is because a car was spotted incorrectly or not spotted at all, but mistakenly showing as placed by the, the conductor. Um, we get a lot of complaints about customers about this. And basically because this has a often has a huge financial consequence because the railways will assess demurrage and uh, detention fees on those rail cars if they're dwelling for more than a certain amount of time. So having those accurate is, or having those inaccurate is a big problem. Cargo loss, uh, obviously that example we went through talked about that, um, but you'd be surprised at how often this type of thing happens, especially bulk commodities moving in hopper cars, uh, you know, product does leak out of them. And uh, lack of rail car visibility, this is not just in terms of you know where it is um, at any point in time, but just what's happening with that rail car. Is it empty or loaded? Um, is it awaiting offload at the shipper? Is it started an offload at the shipper? Has it been switched into a customer's yard? Uh, these types of things. And uh, some more challenges. Um, these ones are more so for the rail car owners. So if you're a fleet manager or uh, a lessor of a fleet, um, there's some different challenges that you might be focused on. Now, some of these are applicable to uh, rail car shippers as well. Um, probably no matter which part of the rail industry you're in, these will uh, be important to note. Um, so there's suboptimal routing decisions. Shippers might be choosing, shippers control the routing that they send their car on, um, but that routing may not be the, the most optimal routing for the rail car owner itself. The shipper doesn't necessarily own the car all the time. Um, and that could be because it's a longer mileage routing or it goes through more difficult territory that has high wear and tear on the car. So, you know, these, these factors aren't really taken into consideration today with shippers. It's usually those routing decisions are based off of cost. Um, a high cost of trackside infrastructure. This challenge is very specific to the railways, but um, in, in terms of maintaining all these wayside scanners that they have, but these costs ultimately affect everyone in the rail car supply chain through higher pricing charged by the railways. Unknown true asset utilization. So what do I mean by true? This is really knowing what is actually happening with the cars, you know, shunting activity. Is there uh, big impacts as it's being shunted or switched from one train or one track to another. Um, and then any other unwanted events like a, a handbrake on while in motion, for example. So all of these things are sort of invisible right now and it's unknown, hard to measure. Inefficient fleet management. It is hard to manage a fleet when there is zero visibility to your rail car while it is on a short line with no scanners or when it is dwelling at a customer. 
Um, while it's at a customer, there may be no indication for when that rail car might be released empty or when that rail car is loaded and is ready to be billed. Hard to manage your fleet when there's zero visibility to that. And finally, reactive rail car maintenance. Rail cars go through scheduled maintenance periodically, um, but obviously if there is a, a significant issue that suddenly happens that was unexpected, they have to go in for maintenance then too. And that is something that today is very reactive. There is no visibility to the potential of those issues happening. Um, and that's something that hopefully telematics can start addressing so that uh, they can become a little bit more predictable. So hopefully everyone's still with me. Hopefully I've done a good job so far on demonstrating the various reasons why telematics for rail cars is needed. We just went through a whole bunch of challenges I haven't really talked about how Telemax will solve them, but that's what we're going to talk about. But these are all challenges that we have, and we've seen the market share decline via truck. Um, so really what we're trying to do is make rail cars smart and solve the existing challenges faced by professionals in the logistics space and giving them the information they need to make better decisions and ultimately make it easier for them to choose rail instead of truck. So that's why we need to make rail cars smart. Now, putting telematics on rail cars is not as simple as it sounds, and there are many important considerations uh, to install these devices and put them on a rail car. Um, so please keep these in mind, whether you're a telematics vendor, a rail car owner, or a shipper, um, please keep these in mind as you start thinking more about how to incorporate rail car telematics into your plans. Um, you know, I, there's ease of installation, you know, how easy is the device to install? This is obviously a very important point. What is the data security of the communication between the sensors and the gateway or the you know, main device and, you know, communicating that to the back end servers and computers? Um, you know, how well are the sensors connected to the gateway that reports out the, the information? Um, and then, of course, the device durability and safety. Can it operate in all sorts of hazardous environments? Is it built to withstand the rugged temperatures and operating conditions that the railway industry has in not just North America, but all around the world? Um, and then also just is, is the device compatible with multiple different types of rail cars? Each rail car is unique and is designed differently. Can the device have uh, universability across all those different rail car types? So we at ZTR have been thinking about these uh, considerations very seriously. And when we've developed our solution, we have taken these points in mind and have developed a solution specifically with these points in mind. So without further ado, that's introducing the solution that we have for the industry um, to help bring telematics uh, to the industry and solve these real world challenges and problems that we've been discussing. So, as Shabam mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we've been, ZTR has been in the rail industry for 37 years, and we want to continue to provide solutions to the industry. So we decided to partner with BlackBerry, many of you are familiar with them, uh, and combine their expertise in asset tracking solutions with our expertise in the railway side of things to develop our joint solution, Pivot, which is our advanced rail car monitoring platform. So what is Pivot? What is this exactly? Pivot is a suite of telematic sensors combined with an IoT gateway device installed on a rail car. The gateway device serves as a central communication hub collecting data from the sensors which are strategically placed on the rail car to monitor specific conditions. The sensors transmit these data points to the gateway which then relays it to a central monitoring system which ultimately feeds into a user interface portal which customers can access to gather real-time information on their assets, along with analytics and insights into their fleet. So I know that was a lot to, to go over. I'm gonna actually visually give a representation of how this works for those who maybe couldn't follow along. So this is just a, a representation of a boxcar. We, we chose a, a single door boxcar for this illustrative purposes, but obviously this could be any rail car, a tanker, a hopper, uh, freight wagon, I know, is referred to in, in other parts of the world. Um, but there'd be basically be four different devices or sensors installed on the rail car. 
So the first one is the main GPS slash gateway device that transmits all the information. Um, this device is capable of monitoring and tracking your exact locations in real time and monitoring whether it's stopped or started or, or you know, whether it's in motion or not. Um, and it also measures impact detection. So it can detect significant shocks or impacts to the rail car. We've kind of put the uh, number one here um, just as an example, but really this device can be mounted anywhere on the rail car. Our device is designed to be agnostic in terms of where the device is placed. Um, so this is just an example, but it can really go anywhere. Then there's a, a handbrake sensor. And what does it do? It monitors the status of the handbrake, whether the handbrake is engaged or released. This one obviously has to be placed on the on the handbrake itself, so it's there at the, the end of the car. And this is why this is important is, you know, to detect whether a handbrake is on while a car isn't moving, because that can potentially result in a flat wheel, which leads to large maintenance costs and something everyone wants to avoid. Then we have a door sensor. This goes without saying, it basically is monitoring the status of the door. Um, this can also be a, a hatch sensor as well. So we talked about the ammonium nitrate example. It can also be a device placed on the outlet gates on a hopper car. It can even be placed on the top hatch of a rail car, um, like a tanker, for example. Um, but because we have a box car listed here, this specific example would be directly on the door. Um, and it basically just provides a status of whether that door is open or closed. And you can imagine some of the reasons why this is important, but this can help identify whether a, a shipper has begun loading, whether a receiver has begun offloading, whether there's been any tampering, like a door opening somewhere it shouldn't have opened, um, or even just detecting a faulty door, a door that keeps sliding open and doesn't latch. And, uh, and then there's a sensor for indicating a, the load status. So is a rail car loaded or empty? Um, and again, this, this uh, can help drive decisions and you know, not avoid, but at least know what may have happened in that ammonium nit nitrate example right away. Um, and then this also can just help determine, okay, is this car loaded and ready to be released or is this car still empty and needs to be loaded? And you, know, you can uh, drive decisions from that. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, hopefully you have a better understanding of what a rail car telemax solution looks like. I should mention there's a lot more that can go into it. This is sort of where we as ETR are focused as of right now, but we are constantly looking at new ways of bringing additional sensors to the space. And we'll talk about this a little bit, you know, towards the end of the presentation um, as it comes to the future. Um, but now that you hopefully have a better understanding of you know, some of the telematic solutions, we wanted to take you all on a transformative journey of a rail car equipped with telematics and contrast that versus a rail car without. So we'll compare the data that's available today with what could be possible once telematics is installed on a rail car. So this comparison will hopefully shed light on the tangible advantages and improvements that telematics can bring to your rail car operations and how it can solve everyday problems. So here is uh, the beginning of the journey. So before we get too far, the, the rail car first has to be spotted at a facility. Um, and in this scenario, we're, this is kind of the, I like to call this the journey of hell. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong in this scenario. And it's just to illustrate sort of how these things that can go wrong can be helped out or addressed via telematics. So in this case, this empty rail car that was placed at a shipper was placed incorrectly on a backtrack. The conductor logged it as placed, but in fact, it's not placed. Um, so this is where GPS and geofencing can report uh, or can verify whether that car has been incorrectly placed or not. So that's one immediate benefit. Now that the rail car has been placed, we'll assume that problem got resolved. It's now Friday evening and it's not known whether the rail car has begun loading or not. So that's the current status. You just, people don't know. They might have to call the shipper. Maybe you can't get a hold of the shipper. This is where telematics comes in. 
load and door sensors combined can confirm that the car is loaded and ready to be released. Doors are closed, rail car is loaded. So now this rail car is built and it makes its journey. So now the rail car reaches a rail yard and now it sits in that rail yard for five days without any updates. This is quite common. People see that the rail car is now in a rail yard, but then it's just sitting there. And every day they refresh and still sitting there, still sitting there. There's no, no data, nobody knows what's happening with it. This is where telematics can again play a role. Start, stop, and motion detection, as well as impact sensors can show various shunting activities that are happening within the yard. Maybe that car, even just in that track, is moving back and forth multiple times, crashing into other rail cars. Telematics can provide that visibility, whereas today it doesn't exist. And uh, obviously the GPS location can show any miles that it's moved within that rail yard as well. Maybe it moved from one side of the rail yard to another. Those are miles that are previously unaccounted for, for rail car owners. So now the car has left the yard. Today, all that's given is a CLM notification that the car has left the yard. However, combined with a telematics device, there's a warning notification sent out that, hey, this rail car has left the yard, but there's also a handbrake applied and it's moving with a handbrake applied. So that can obviously be a very important point that needs to be addressed right away and telematics can identify that issue. So we'll assume that that issue is rectified. And I will say the railway does have mechanisms to resolve these, these um, issues today, but they don't do it in real time and they don't know about it in real time. It can often take a long time. And that that uh, the fact that a handbrake is on while in motion isn't necessarily shared with the, the shipper. So uh, this is information that the shipper will now for sure have if they have telematics. So the rail car keeps going and it has now reached an interchange location and has received, uh, sorry, it's moving between the rail yard and an interchange location with intermittent CLM reporting, um, but suddenly there's no updates for the CLM. It, the car, there, there's, it's just showing the same location as it was before. So ZTR sensor data reveals that the car has stopped moving and it's sitting in a backtrack. Impact sensor reveals a, a G4 force level impact just before this event skip ahead here this is kind of the same point of the journey the sensor data also shows that a hatch was open and closed simultaneously or one after the other at the time of the impact indicating a potential loss of cargo so the opportunity is to flag the car for maintenance and conduct an investigation again this is information that without telematics would not be available and this is exactly the scenario that you know could have been done on that ammonium nitrate example Okay, we'll assume the problem has been fixed again, continue our journey. Now the car has reached a interchange location, but there is a lack of an uh, AEI scanner on that short line, so there is no further visibility. So all the rail car shipper or owner knows is that the rail car reached a short line interchange, but don't know what's happened to it after that. Is it still there? Has it been picked up by the short line? No idea. Telematics can have you know, geofencing abilities to geofence the interchange location as well as customer destination facilities and combined with the real-time GPS location information provides visibility to where that rail car actually is on the short line as well as accurate ETAs while the car is on the short line. And, you know, better indication of when that car is going to arrive at the customer. And finally, it reaches the shipper, but it's unclear if loading has, or sorry, if unloading has begun or not. All we know is that the car is now at the shipper. Again, with telematics, uh, a warning notification can be generated from the ZTR platform to advise that no hatches have been opened in 24 hours since the arrival. So obviously, if you were to get this type of notification, you could then take action to it and confidently reach out to your receiver and be like, why has this car not been unloaded yet despite it's being there for 24 hours. So again, this is visibility that is not available today. And uh, finally, once that rail car is unloaded, uh, again, these load sensors can determine that now the car is unloaded and that can trigger a uh, empty rail car release to the railway and make sure that that car is picked up in a timely fashion, ultimately reducing the dwell time 
and improving cycle times on the fleet. Again, something that can't be done today. So hopefully that journey gave a good overview of all of the different information points and challenges that can be solved um, with telematics. And if a supply chain professional had access to telematics, as well as show how that information can be used to take control of your rail car operations. I should mention as well that beyond some of the challenges telematics can immediately solve as shown in that rail car journey, there are many other potential future benefits that telematics can unlock once critical mass is achieved within the industry. For example, we believe that railways will leverage the telematics data once it's more widely uh, spread um, to make smarter train handling and rail car routing decisions. Shippers will use telematics to automate these rail car billing and release processes. And we believe even the AAR, the Association of American Railways, will eventually mandate the usage of telematics and that will remove the need for all sorts of various wayside detectors. So all of those items are future items, um, but you know we are already thinking and planning for these future scenarios and we are excited about what the future holds and hope you are as well. So with that, uh, that brings us to the end of the webinar. How much time do we have? We've left about 15 minutes for questions and answers. So. Um, if anyone's got questions that they haven't already posed, please put them into the chat. We'll, Jason and I will do our best to answer them. Thank you, Jared. You have spoken a lot and I wouldn't trouble you much with the question, but we do have a few questions and I'll uh, ask everyone, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to drop in the chat, uh, chat bar or the questions part that you see. And to start with a few questions that we already have, uh, Jason, would you mind taking them? I'll just ask you what these, tell you what these questions are. The first sure. one is, does the system have a built-in GPS antenna? Yes, it does. Actually, it has both a built-in GPS and cellular antenna, so there is no need to connect anything external to the, to the gateway device. Okay, we have another question. Uh, how are the telematics? devices on each car powered? Yeah, so the gateway devices themselves are powered by a primary um, battery. Uh, they're uh, designed to uh, be um, long lived on, on rail cars. Um, so, you know, temperature and the harsh rail environment, um, you know, they're meant to design to, uh, they're designed, I'm sorry, to be uh, to use for these applications. So um, each individual device, uh, the sensors and the gateways uh, are individually powered by um, their own battery. Okay, and we have Eric who's asking, what type of sensors are available specifically for tank cars? While I believe we have a sensors which are applicable for all the cars, but Jason, would you mind taking yeah. that? What types of sensors are available specifically for tank cars? For sure. So the the sensors that we have um, are applicable to any car, but definitely can be installed on in tank cars as well. So the handbrake sensor, the load sensor, um, and and the hatch sensor as well could op um, detect opening on uh, man weights and different uh, openings on the car itself. Okay. And then we have Charles who has a couple of questions. I guess he was late. So he asks, like, is this still a new initiative or has it been installed on a train and tested for some time? It has been tested for some time. So this has been installed on a number of different car types um, and in different environments. Um, and yes, most definitely um, it is it has been used for, for a number of years now. Yeah, I'll just add to that uh, as well, just to bring further insight. Um, all of those, the members of Rail Pulse that we kind of spoke to, almost all of them, if not all of them, have been trialing and utilizing our devices already. And uh, so, yeah, we have you know quite a few devices out there in the market today. Okay, another question. I believe we have answered part of it, but Charles continues with, my assumption is that there has to be a battery on each vehicle. If so, how long would the system be online on a single charge? Yeah, so the the batteries that we use are not rechargeable, but they will typically last upward to five years. Um, so they've been, like I said, been tested um, in different scenarios on different cars, different utilization. Um, so we've have been optimizing our algorithms to to allow them to um, to last upwards of five years. Okay. And I should mention too that the the battery is replaceable. So at the end of that five year lifespan, um, 
the all that's needed is just to replace the battery itself the telematics device like the hardware that holds the battery and, and reports on the sensors that that can last well in excess of of that time frame and yeah that's like uh, the five years that we speak about is like when we use it like kind of at the maximum capacity but if used optimally we the battery lasts i believe more than five years and up to eight years or nine years the battery can last for our telematic devices we have a lot more questions wow questions are keep coming in so there's one question can the telematic solution be applied to all types of rail cars including specialized or custom built models so so yes absolutely the cars do not require to be installed on any specific car types um if it's meant to be generic so the device is designed to be installed on a standard bracket um, and we've designed these brackets such that they can be installed on on any type of car. They're typically welded to the car itself. Um, you know, that gives obviously the rigidity and make sure that they um, stay attached. And furthermore, we've got flexibility, um, you know, where the gateway device is going to be installed. So Jared kind of mentioned to this and alluded to it that, um, you know, with the wireless technology and communications that are used, um, the sensors obviously need to be placed in a specific location. Um, but lots of flexibility where that gateway device itself can be installed. Okay. And what is the expected lifespan of your telematic solutions? How does the company ensure its longevity and reliability? So we do a few things. So one of them, it's built to a very high standard. So uh, the goal here is obviously for it to last, you know, in the rail environment for a long period of time. As Jared had mentioned, you know, obviously the battery pack, and we've optimized the algorithms that are, are implemented on there to, to last upwards of five years, and they can be replaced afterwards. And then the other thing that we do is the configuration and the firmware updates themselves are all done over the air. So we can kind of continue to enhance the capabilities um, you know, of the solution over time, um, add new features and fix any issues that might exist or change configuration if required. Okay. And then there's this interesting question, like, which says, you spoke about the ammonium nitrate case. So is your solution pivot safe for use in hazardous environments such as those with flammable gases or dust? Yeah, so it is actually certified to C1D1, so it is safe to operate in those areas. And for people who aren't aware, C1D1 just stands for Class One Division One. It's a it's a um, a division or class of of uh, dangerous chemicals and products that it's uh, that's like the the most dangerous. So it's certified for that. To Jason's point. Okay, and there's another quite different question and but it's like what are some potential cyber security risks associated with telematic systems and how does pivot address these concerns yeah so the the device itself is is fully self-contained uh there's no connectors on it um all the device uh, all sorry all the data that's stored on the device is encrypted um using industry standards uh and the data that's communicated off of the device um is also all encrypted um, the server applications that Jared alluded to where all that data processing occurs and how people access it, again, are all implemented using industry standard um, you know, requirements and are certified as such. So um, it really is meant to be fully secure end to end. Yeah, and I'll just add to that that you know, as, as I briefly mentioned, we partnered with BlackBerry, and they're you know the kind of encryption experts, and we use their level of encryption that's trusted by world governments all around the world so uh, i think that's a very strong point we have and we have another question you mentioned a five-year battery life does the sensor send you the remaining life such as such that a battery re replacement can be scheduled i believe it does, that but jason would you yeah yep. yeah it does actually so um on a regular basis the all the sensors actually communicate back to the gateway um and indicate their battery status that information is then made available through the portal application or the the web-based application um you view through mobile as well um giving you an indication of just how um, whether or not the battery is in a good state or not uh and and should be scheduled for replacement okay the questions aren't stopping and anyways uh, how difficult is the installation process for the pivot system and can it be done without disrupting rail car operations? Yeah, most definitely. It's meant to be as simple as possible. So as mentioned, you know, we're working with standard uh, brackets, um, so you don't need to, uh, you know, change the bracket types depending on the cars. Uh, the load sensor and handbrake sensor, they also have separate um, 
uh, it, uh, brackets as well. Um, so it's a real repeatable process. And the other thing that we include is a mobile application, which streamlines the installation. So as you're adding these, you'd be able to scan in the serial numbers, make the association between the gateway and the sensors, and then upload that information so it's ready in the back office. So all of those things that need to be done to get the device configured and set up um, can all be done trackside with the, uh, with the car. And I should mention too that we provide some installation support and guidelines on how to do the install properly. And some of the parties that we're working with, um, they've indicated that you know ours is very easy to install and it can be installed in under 10 minutes for one rail car. Okay, and we have another similar question, like which says, for all the functionality, is there just one master sensor box and wiring out to portions of the car you want to monitor? How long does it take to apply the system and certify it is working? So the installation of the and to get that certified that that takes um, you know it, it really depends on just the how quickly you can get it installed on the car uh, and then be able to enter that information through the mobile application. It also I should mention it can be done through the back office as well. So there are some manual processes. So once that information is entered, uh, the main gateway device wakes up. Um, and begins communicating with the sensors that are on the car, verifies the configuration, uploads the configuration to them, uh, and then starts operating. And all that can be verified through both the back office application, the web-based application, and the mobile application itself. Yep, and the first part of the question, like for all the functionality, is there just one master sensor box and wiring out to portions of the car you want to monitor? So James, it's not so, it's like we have a central uh, telematic IoT, uh, or IoT gateway, and then we have sensors placed at different parts in the real car way, which send information to the IoT gateway wirelessly. And then the gateway sends it through cellular networks to servers, which then we see on our systems. Yeah. yeah and I think just to succinctly answer that, there's there's one sort of gateway device that transmits all the information per rail car. Per um, rail car, yeah. yeah. And then there's another interesting question it's like, do companies need to purchase new rail cars or retrofit existing ones to integrate the pivot telematics? Yeah, so it actually works in both. Um, you know, so there is no issues if you want to install it as a retrofit. Um, and there's no requirement that it has to be installed at the factory. So um, both support both those models in terms of installation. Okay. And are there any ongoing maintenance and support to, support requirements for your solution? No, there's not. So when, after installation, um, they're meant to be very low touch. So uh, as I mentioned before, all the firmware configuration updates um, are done over the air. Um, there's nothing that needs to be done to the device that does not need to be regularly recalibrated um, or updated in, the, in that way. So um, really meant to be once installed, um, you know, just continues to work. So the, you know, once the battery is, is um, you know, depleted, yes, there's a, a replacement um, battery option that's uh, that can be implemented. So that would be the limit of the maintenance required. Um, but those maintenance yeah, windows then, are, are extended. Yeah, and just to add to that, it, we kind of briefly touched on it, but the device itself is is meant to withstand the harshest conditions you can think of, you know, minus 40 degrees Celsius, you know, dirty environments where there's lots of dust or debris floating around, it can work in the dark, you know, there's really no limitations um, to, you know, that, so that, that, that avoids the need for maintenance. Okay, then we have one more. Uh, can the pivot solution integrate with existing rail car management systems or software platforms? So there are APIs that are implemented, um, you know, with the product that we support and keep up to date. So all of the information that's available in the portal can be integrated to other applications as required. Okay. And then there's another question. How are the sensors mapped to the exact location of the rail car and track? So there's two ways that that's done. Um, there are the standard, um, you know, rail car locations or mounting locations. Those are all um, reflected in the portal application and the web-based uh, and, and the mobile application and installation. So that can all be entered. Um, and then there's some generic ones supported as well for, for other applications. Those standard mounting locations are, are part of the, the rail pulse um, requirement in terms of, you know, standard locations, uh, installation locations and, and are reported as such. Okay, I guess we have 
a lot more questions coming in and we are just out of time so we may i guess we missed answering few questions but we'll get in touch to provide all the answers that you have asked in the chat and i would like to thank everyone for joining in some very interesting questions were there and we are happy to answer all of these we'll get in touch with you if we haven't been able to provide you answers swati will we can share the slide deck we'll send that to you or to everyone and following this webinar you can expect to receive a survey tomorrow we'll send the recording of this webinar to you in around a week and yeah thank you everyone once again have a great evening thank you thank you